Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Course Grind Podcast. My name is Sean Rosser, your host, your guide for the next 30 to 45 minutes for all things culinary. This is episode 10. You know, when I first started putting this podcast together, I figured I might be good for an episode, maybe two, three at the tops, but to actually be looking at double digits, to be looking at episode 10, and to be looking at it with the guest who I have tonight is just mind-blowing to me. So if you have listened, if this is your first time listening now, thank you. You know, without you tuning in, without you giving interest for it, it really would have just fallen flat. So I really appreciate it. And certainly, episode 10, I hope you enjoy the rock star chef that I have for you this evening. You know, over the years of being a Top Chef diehard, uh, two seasons for me have stood out as my respective favorites. They are season four and season nine, um, Chicago and Texas, respectfully. Uh, And tonight's episode, it's not going to vary from that. It's only going to solidify that trend. Tonight's guest, raised in Houston, Texas, uh, developed a love for the culinary arts as a very small child. She spent the majority of her free time cooking and baking with her grandparents while her mother traveled for work. Our guest attended the Art Institute of Houston and attained her associate's degree in the culinary arts in 2001. To gain hands-on experience and further broaden her love of all things Italian, she began traveling to Italy at least once a year to work with and visit some of the country's best chefs and food producers. She cooked in some of the most heralded Italian kitchens, including Il San Lorenzo and Grano in Rome, Il Regoletto in Reggiolo, and Del Pescatore, the three Michelin-starred restaurant in Boy, this is where my pronunciation is going to go south, but whatever. Canento Sololio. <laughs> Having Perfect. left, thank, thank God, thank God she's laughing. Having left one of her more recent gigs as executive chef at Spagia just last year, and even more recently rocking the Top Chef at Sea Cruise, she's currently in the Herculean process, no pressure at all, of opening her very own restaurant, Monteverde, in Chicago, shooting for a spring 2015 opening. And yet, and yet, through all of this she found the time to do this show to do episode 10 and therefore she's even more awesome than i imagined and that's a whole shitload of awesome ladies and gentlemen everyone in between my guest this evening runner up from top chef texas season nine chef sarah grunberg chef how are you doing this evening (laughs) wow that was quite an introduction i'm doing well thank you awesome awesome glad to hear it um you know, we, I, I started speaking to you when um, you were just getting ready to head out for Top Chef at Sea. How was that? Oh, it was too much fun. It wasn't. It was. It was all fun and games. So it was good. I was there with my friend Chris yeah. Perry, who was on my season, and uh, Kristen Kish from season after me, who actually won. So uh, we had we had a good time. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, you all seem like you're very straight laced and, uh, you know, very serious. You probably read books at night. Yeah, we definitely didn't know the bartenders by name or where they were from. None of that. Uh, we, right, you know, we tore it up pretty right. well. So. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Awesome. 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 So um, just to give you an idea, um, how the podcast works. We've got three sections of questions, starters, mains, and afters. Starters, I want to know, Chef, where you're from, where you came from, how you came up, and what, what it was that led you to food. After that, we're going to talk about where you're at, where you're going in the near future. And finally, the afters, more kind of off-the-cuff, out-of-the-box questions. Um, but again, just super good time. And so without further ado, uh, Chef Sarah Grunberg, where did you grow up eating? Well, I grew up in, in Houston, Texas with my mom. Uh, she was a really hard worker, and she basically you know, made me for made me who I am now. And uh, I grew up eating you know food by my grandparents. You know, my mom traveled a lot. And so I kind of had like these foster families that would take care of me which I know sounds weird or interesting, but, um, you know, she traveled a lot for her job. And so, you know, I mean, definitely I'm sure she hates the fact that she missed, you know, some of those better years, but at the same time it showed me as a young girl, like, you know, put your career first, good things will happen to you. 
I work really hard. And on top of that, I was eating foods from like several different households, which a lot of kids, you know, they eat the same thing every night or every day at lunch. I know when I was in high school, we really didn't venture the school cafeteria line. So I think I got to, I was, you know, tasting foods that were totally different than what, you know, my mom cooked or my family cooked. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, it, it, it's it's so common that, that, that you're with strong um, female chefs. They had such a strong, you know, maternal figure uh, uh, to look up to. And, and it sounds like that that held true for you. It's cool. Um, when when you were growing up, um, I know you mentioned th- that th- that you did eat in a lot of different environments. Um, what kind of an eater were you? Were you picky? Were you not? Oh, I was, oh my gosh, how do I turn that off? Um, I was not picky (laughs) really at all. The only thing I didn't like was like fresh tomato, which I know is kind of strange. But I think a lot of kids are kind of like, ugh. Um, I I really kind of ate everything. In fact, I remember kids thinking I was weird because I would eat like salsa verde or like Brussels sprouts. Um, you right know, on. food was kind of always right a thing that was fun. And when I started cooking, like I started cooking at my house kind of virtually after cooking with my grandparents by myself at the age of like 12. I don't even know why I was allowed to do that, but I was. And so, you know, the, the more and more I... I got comfortable with it. I started branching out and cooking other things. Like I remember the first time I cooked a leek, like there's this recipe. I don't, I think it was like a pasta dish and it had leeks and something else in it. And I cut the whole leek (laughs) and put the whole thing in the (laughs) pot. And um, I, (laughs) you know, I was like, wow, that green part's real tough, but I had no idea, you know? And I think I was probably like, I don't know, 13 or 14. Um, so definitely always have been, uh, you know, excited to taste other things. That was kind of the fun part of growing up for me was food. Yeah, for I sure. I guess it, it's always been the yeah. fun part of my life. But food is something that, you know, yeah, as a and- single, as an only child, you know, you can really entertain yourself by by trying out a recipe. Right, right. For sure. For sure. Um and a fellow only child, no less. So I'm I'm super like, it, like impressed with the similarity. Um, and you know, like you said, just having that exposure across the board, it's it seems like that that that's basically is such fertile ground to grow someone who's going to be super super interested uh, in, in in food. And uh, obviously, in your that, that held to be true. You know, when you look back at those childhood foods and those foods that you grew up with, um, do you miss any in particular? Like, like which childhood foods do you miss the most? Does any one in particular give you like a deep down pain of, of just missing it? A childhood dish that it could be anything, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, is it something that I cooked? Is it something my family cooked? It can be any of that. Oh, man. Well, I think chefs, we taste with our brains. And so I think at a young age, I probably started, you know, taking notes of what I was tasting. But one of my favorite dishes that I, that makes me like, just so happy is my grandmother's sausage bread. Oh my God. It's so good. Oh, it's like this sweet, like it's like a yeast dough that she makes. And then there's a little bit of sugar in it. So it's not super sweet, but it definitely isn't like super savory either. And then she wraps it around, um, my grandfather's homemade venison pork sausage and like bakes it like a loaf. <laughs> So you have this like giant, like what looks like a loaf of bread, but inside is like, like link, like either if I was lucky, there'd be two links and the sausage bread 
or if not, you know, there would be uh, one, but I can taste that now. And I always remember loving the dough that was directly around the sausage because that was the dough that had kind of been saturated with some of the juices from the sausage. So it was always so interesting to me how the crust was so firm and crispy, but then, you know, as you got into the bread that it got soft and beautiful and a totally different animal. Oh man. I, I mean, first of all, you, you come out of the gates and, and you mentioned sausage bread as one entity. You're talking about sausage and you're talking about bread. There's no way that can be a bad thing. But from the sound of it, it was, you know, practically a piece of art. Yes. Well, you know, in fact, my grandmother, she's still alive. I'm so blessed. And she'll, she makes it, it's harder for her to make it now. Um, both of my grandparents are still alive and, uh, they make my grandpa still does some sausage, but I think my uncle and cousins help out a little bit more now. But there will still be like a surprise, like I don't know, like three or four loaves being baked around Christmas, and there's definite like favoritism being played there <laughs> because <laughs> I always get a loaf. And then my cousins find out that I get one and they get very angry. In fact, one of my older cousins used to hide it from me um, so he could have all of it. And I was littler. So, <laughs> um, you know, it still kind of goes on to this this day. Everyone's like, where's the sausage bread? I want the sausage bread. <laughs> and I don't know if it has like a like a dish name. We just have always called it sausage bread. So. Sausage bread, I like it. It's it's simple. It, it, the name says what it is. You know, how can you argue with that? So, you know, sausage bread was this thing that 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 takes you back. When you look back, was was there anybody in particular who stands out as like your greatest culinary influence? Uh, I mean, definitely my grandparents because they they made everything from scratch. They had a garden. My grandfather had cattle like I grew up with like in the south everyone has a deep freezer and so I grew up with like a deep freezer with like a half a cow in it you know like all these cuts just wrapped in like white butcher's paper and they would be like stamped like not for sale and because uh, my grandfather you know when he would process he would divide it up between his four kids so I think for me culinarily they really taught me, you know, not, not on purpose. They weren't like, come Sarah, look at what this is. But, you know, inadvertently really taught me what food is, where it comes from. Um, what does it mean to, you know, have a piece of meat? What does it mean to grow corn, to grow, grow broccoli? How do you grow potatoes? So all those things really kind of, I think, really work for me. Um, my uncle also uh, would would cook with me a good amount of time and he always would make the meat and I would always make the starch. So I was always making like mac and cheese or mashed potatoes and he was always making like chicken fried steak. And then he realized I could make it and then I was in charge of making all of it. <laughs> so ah, very um, nice say definitely my grandparents and my my right uncle on, right on yeah yeah and y y you know speaking it's of mac and cheese yes. uh, and, and 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 this <laughs> kind of breaks form here but recently i saw a picture of you judging a mac and cheese competition oh, <laughs> oh my god how funny was that how adorable was the that little is cheese and it was fun. It, it, that's that's crazy I mean, to me. Um, how how do you was, even how do you even judge such a thing? It's all good. It's all starch and cheese. Well, you know there is there. There's it's all good, but to be great is what's really hard. So that's how you judge it. Right. Right. You know, oh, I'm I'm, I'm I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> and I've, I've, you know, I, I think we've all had bad mac and cheese. And growing up, I absolutely despised it. But my wife, who um, comes from from Allentown, so 
there's this Pennsylvania Dutch influence. She just slung some mac and cheese this weekend, this past weekend, with fried chicken. I mean, uh, just just yeah, roll me into a corner and leave me alone. I'm good. That's not the best meals ever. Like mac and cheese with either roast chicken or fried chicken or chicken fried steak. Dude. Mm. That's it. That's, really that's it. That's, that's the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> right there. Cool. So when uh, we've we've identified your grandparents, you know, as definitely that solid influence, uncle, definitely an influence. When was it growing up around all this just just awesomeness that you realized food was more than just, you know, from plate to mouth to stomach to energy? When did you realize it's what you wanted to do? Was it a person? Was it a moment? Was it a dish? You know, when I was about 12 years old, that's when the Food Network started. And I had always, as a little girl, watched PBS. Like, I watched the Frugal Gourmet. I used to think he was awesome. In fact, Frugal um, Gourmet, Jeff Smith, was like the first pizza dough uh, I ever made out of his, like, Jeff Smith Cooks Italy. I think he might have uh, gotten in trouble there after a uh, while. Uh, um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he, he did a little bit. But I remember watching his show and thinking it was so great. And um, so food, food TV or cooking shows always were kind of on PBS. And then all of a sudden came this Food Network. And I'm talking like the beginning of Food Network. This would have been like, see, when I was 12, we're talking like 92, 93. And... It was Young, Young Emerald with Essence of Emerald. Bobby Flay had, like, a city, like, country grilling show that was, like, he cooked the gas grill, and then this country guy cooked the country grill. And there were shows like Chef Du Jour that had, you know, chefs daily. And that's when I realized, whoa, you know, aside growing in, up in Houston, where at the time it was a lot of chain restaurants, you never saw chefs. I didn't know there were chefs, you know? And to see these people right. that were young and and chefs, it, it that's when it kind of, I was like, wow, you can actually be a chef. And, you know, I just always cooked. I would come home from school and cook for my friends, like every, almost every day. Everyone knew, like, if Sarah was cooking, that you came over. My Saturdays would be, like, making a big pan of lasagna, you know, or something. And so I I was not the best student in high school, I have to say. I rebelled a little bit and wanted to hang out with my friends and, uh, you know, skip school and all that jazz. Um, but uh, needless to say, I wasn't doing too well my junior year, and my aunt, my aunt Barbara, who's, you know, another one of the people that I really look up to, looked up to, looked at me and said, Sarah, why don't you just go into cooking? Like you love to cook. And obviously school isn't really what's working out for you. And I'm sure my mom was like ready to hit her. Like, you know, what are you talking about? And, um, I actually ended up dropping out of high school in my junior year. Uh, I got my GED that summer and was in Rolled in culinary school, uh, starting culinary school that September of what would all my friends are going into senior year, and I was starting culinary school. So in That's so awesome. many ways, awesome. it like saved me. Yeah. Uh, after that, it was like that was it. Like I never looked back. You know, I never needed to rebel, and you know not take care of, of Sarah, basically it, when you find your passion, your life changes. And, you know, I'm really blessed to have found it so young. You know, I, I, I feel I, you know, I, I wish that for a lot of people to really let your kids do what they need to do. You know, if they're not the best student, if they're not in school, if they're skipping school or doing things, maybe it's because it's not for them. Maybe they're artistic and, creative and, and aren't in it you know you're not finding what you need from that so yeah 
<laughs> right on, right on. And that's, that's, that's absolutely spot on. You know, um, so many, so many things I want to tangent off of that with, but you're absolutely right. You know, as, as an educator myself, you know, when, when, when we look at people as, as either smart or not smart, it's not that cut and dry, you know, there's, there's multiple layers of intelligence. And when we can tap in to what it is that someone does well, and, and you hear this so frequently in the culinary field with great culinary stories is that, Hey, this just wasn't working out for me. But when you get put in that situation and it's artistic, it's, it, it just, it hones certain people. And it sounds like that was totally your story. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, culinary school back then, I'm not sure the statistic now, but I, I think it was like low, like a, a 15 to 20% graduation rate. Um, so a lot of pe a lot of kids, a lot of people would join culinary school because they watched Food Network, you know, they thought it'd be cool to create and like put stuff on the plate. And then you get in school and you're like burning yourself, cutting yourself. You have to learn like boring knife cuts and you know, you're like, it's not all that it's cut out to be. But for me, I found it just fascinating. So I'm I'm really lucky. Again, my second really lucky moment was that it actually <laughs> was the right fit for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's 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 the other thing too. Um and, and I, I swear to God, you know, once once Monteverde is going and if I'm ever coming through Chicago, we at least have to grab a couple drinks together because um you know, Food Network, I remember in ninety two, David Rosengarden, uh Grillin' and Chillin', yeah. I believe, was the City Boy Country Boy grill show. Um uh what what, what was yeah, the, the chillin'. there was a game show on there. Um Yeah, ready set cook. Ready, set, cook. That's what it was. Yeah. So, like, I, I remember that era, and I remember looking at it. And, I mean, obviously, you know, I didn't go to culinary school, but my wife and I, we, we you know, we we just – we love food. We love all aspects of it. That's, that's why I'm doing a podcast about food to begin with. You know, there's so much more to it. So, I mean, you know, it led you to culinary school. It led me to a better – like more elevated appreciation of, of food as art, that it's more than just what we sling. And you mentioned PBS, Jeff Smith, Frugal Gourmet, my first cookbook my mom ever got me. So, I mean, I am completely yeah. 100% right there with you. Awesome. 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 Yeah, I think so, I still have so, I mean, that's. Book. <laughs> and I think I got it at like half price books. I'm sure my mom was like, what is wrong with this child? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my dad. My dad used to have to unplug the TV um, during the summer in the mornings because Yan Ken Cook was on PBS, and I'd watch the yeah. shit out of that. Yeah, it was great. Unbelievable. It was great. So, you know, so I, cool. I That's. Am uh, I mean. Sorry, right I, I, right now on. that uh, I'm in the middle of like the of, of you know kind of preparing for this restaurant. I'm like falling in love with like Uber Keller's show on PBS right now. Like it's so oh. great. And it's, like Lydia Bastianich. So it's funny how things kind of come full circle. They do. They do. You're absolutely right. You know, um, mind of a chef, not to just like completely name drop shows and everything, but mind of a chef was one first season. It was narrated by Bourdain and, uh, uh, David Chang was on it and I I watched every episode easily nine or ten times and I thought the very same thing that you said about the full circle isn't it funny PBS seems to almost be having a resurgence of um, culinary yeah, relevance I guess best. oh my god they're so Agreed. good okay. you know and not to mention <laughs> you know Rick Bayless Rick Bayless has you know been been doing great things on PBS for a really long time. Yep. Um, really funny about uh, Mind of a Chef. You know, I, I'm watching April Bloomfields right now, and like I got all like teary eyed and, and emotional because she's just so amazing. And you know, to watch her open um, Tosca restaurant was kind of really crazy. And then you know, Ed Lee's doing it now. Like my Ed Lee from season nine. 
Asian businessman. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to watch mm -hmm. his new season. Yeah. Oh, that's that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. So, um, so to bring it completely back, somewhat awkwardly, probably I don't know, but um, so that's how <laughs> you got from square one to where you're at today. And I mean, what a cool story. So that's, I mean, as far as starters go, that's that's a gr uh, an amazing story, not a great story, an amazing story. Um, let's fast forward then a little bit to present day. Um, you know, you, you're going in, you're getting ready for Monteverde. Um, where are you drawing your culinary inspiration from now the most? Person, place, thing, idea? Oh, my gosh. Intense questions here. Um, <laughs> I am drawing my inspiration from... I've been really blessed over the past few years since Top Chef to do some pretty awesome traveling that's kind of opened my eyes. And, and ultimately, Top Chef forced me to think outside the box. And, like, you know, if, if you watch my finale meal compared to, you know, my season, I think I totally grew as a chef and, and became confident and, and doing different flavors and techniques that I would have never done. Um, so I'm definitely, you know, trying to make sure that I'm not doing anything fusion, but um, definitely pulling some inspiration from my travels and just different ethnicities that I, I love to eat. Like, like people don't realize that Houston has like one of the largest Vietnamese populations and I love Vietnamese food and I cook a lot of Vietnamese food in my home because uh, I crave it because I used to eat it, you know, almost three times a week in Houston. Um, so kind of as an example, uh, that's kind of doing it for me. But also, I think for me to just try to do things really simply, I don't want to I don't want to overcomplicate it. It's really challenging to think uh, for me, like about the new restaurant and the menu and how can I. How can I push the boundaries but not push them too much, you know? So keeping mm -hmm. it simple, but definitely mm -hmm. the tra my travels are really playing a big role. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, sure. And, 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 and I mean, that certainly makes sense as a place to draw it from, um, you know, the, the Vietnamese. Yeah, and and not, to, not to disparage your finale offering because, I mean, the braised veal cheek – with the sweetbread and polenta, I can still remember. And admittedly, did I do some homework? Did I do some research? Yes, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And so, I mean, certainly, you know, not <laughs> not shabby at all, but throw that travel in, and I imagine it's just, it's given you that much more um, to pull from. Yes, that's, yeah. But I got to listen For to sure. the little voice that says... Slow it down, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. And uh, <laughs> hopefully I, I, can, I can borrow that voice sometime when I'm uh, either hovering over a plate or a project for work. So I think we all need that voice to speak up every once in a while. Um, over your obviously like lengthy, awesome career, can you think of what you made – that makes you stand back and go, that's, that's like, that's my crowning achievement. That's my greatest creation. Can you think of one thing that really kind of stood out to you like that? Oh man. Uh, I don't know. That's hard. I mean, I, I would say the pasta I made on the finale menu on Top Chef with it was a squid ink fettuccine with the coconut milk sauce with the raw prawns on top. To me, that's kind yep. of yep. one of the most yep. beautiful dishes because like, the reason why I chopped the prawns and left them raw on top um, was because how many times do you have a pasta with shellfish and the shellfish is like, big and clunky and you can't like eat it with the pasta. You have to like fish around to find the shellfish 
or it's really overcooked. Right. And so this idea to take something like the, the, the wild spot prawns and chop them into a tartare to where as the, the, you know, the diner, you just like slowly stir them into the hot pasta with the sauce and it becomes one beautiful dish. To me, mm -hmm. that was like the angels singing because it, it, you know, there was more to it than just making a pasta. You know, I thought about how I wanted people to eat it. And, and if you ate it, I don't think you would say, oh, wow, this is awesome. I get prawn in every bite until you mention it. But it just becomes something that's so simple, but yet there's so much thought that went into it. Is is yeah. definitely one of those yeah, turning I'm, points uh, for yeah. me. And yeah. so I think about food. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can't... You can't look at that finale menu and, and and I mean realizing this is this is two two plus years ago at this point. You, you can't look at that menu and go, ah, wow, well, she kind of softballed it in. I mean, there's there's absolute love, creativity, and everything that that went into that. But I just you know I I just think looking at that and now hearing you say, hey, you know the the travel has meant that much more to me, has given me that much more. I mean, I'm half tempted to fly out you know, summer 2015 to Chicago, just, just to eat dinner at, at Monte Verde. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to lie. I totally would do that at this point. I think. Uh, do you know why it's called Monte Verde? I don't know why you called it that. I know what it means. I know it means green mountain. Yeah. So Monte Verde was actually, um, the name of the restaurant for the finale menu, which is interesting. I don't know if people, they're not going to connect the dots there. Um, but Monte Verde has been really special for, to me for a really long time. Uh, Monte Verde is Green Mountain in um, Italian. And my last name, Gruenberg, is Green Mountain in German. And the first time I cooked in Italy, like my very first trip, um, I was called, they, basically... These guys I met in Emilia Romagna, they were like, wow, you know, thank you so much for respecting our our culture and our ingredients. And now we're your Sara Monteverde anytime you're in Italy. And for me, that was like, oh my God. <laughs> I've been accepted. <laughs> like, you know, are you serious? So um it actually gives me kind of teary eyed right now thinking about it. But um that's what oh, uh, Monteverde awesome. is. How, Monteverde. how could it not make you too good? That's that's amazing. <laughs> that's 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 like when Costner gets uh, gets his name Dances with Wolves in the movie Dances with Wolves. Like that's when you know you've crossed over. You're obviously doing them right. Wow, that is exactly. the coolest story I think I've ever heard about the restaurant's <laughs> name. Wow, that is so awesome. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, but, no um, problem. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy, but crazy in so an awesome way for sure, for sure. So, you know, obviously your your next big thing personally is Monteverde, Chef Sarah Monteverde. Ha ha, that's that's your secret agent name. But yeah. what what is the next big thing that you foresee in in food in, in general? Like, do you see a trend up and coming now that, that people should be paying attention to? A trend. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of bad at these things, I feel like, uh, only because, like, to me, ramen was a trend before I woke up and realized, holy crap, it's even a bigger trend than I thought it was. Um... Right. And uh, I, I would have to say, I think how, you know, the Scandinavian uh, food and culture has really become pretty big. I, I think that as far as European, I think that there's going to be a lot more stories being told on, as the Mediterranean, as, you know, Turkey, Croatia, um, Greece. I think a lot of those cultures have are really ready for chefs to kind of take under their wing and really tell their story. 
I mean, think about Greek food, for example. I love Greek food, but how many great Greek restaurants are there that, like, are actually right. utilizing right. the ingredients and the culture that's not like, you know, hey, come get the saganaki, like, you know. That was a total Italian voice, by the way. I can't do a good yeah. voice. But I think, you know, <laughs> I would have to say something kind of like that. Um, and then, you know, for me, what a trend that I would hope hope to see at some time and, and more than a trend as a philosophy, I really hope people can start learning um, where their food comes from, especially uh, from an, a live animal uh, place, you know. There's nothing worse, I think, than these factory farms. And, uh, and, and you know, as a chef, it's hard because, you know, pricing of, of an animal that's, you know, either lived a happy life and great feed and was taken care of versus the price of, you know, an, an animal that was factory farmed, it's, it's so, so different. The, there's the gap is too big that I hope that eventually, you know, we'll be able to stand up and say, you know what? No, we don't want to eat chickens that are, you know, caged so high and all that stuff. So I think that comes back from me, yeah, like yeah. going with my grandfather to yeah, yeah. feed his cattle and, you know, those cattle would like run to his truck. Like as soon as they saw the truck, even if they were like all the way in another pasture, I mean, they would see us and start running like they know, like, you know, and so that that's really beautiful to see that. And um, I guess I would hope that would be not a little more than a trend. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, yeah. Yeah. farm the table, um, not to not to go back to the other nine episodes, but, but farm to table seems to be a, a, a big focus. And, you know, anybody who really gives half a shit about what they're putting on a plate is, is concerned with the sourcing of, of their, of their materials. And, um, you know, to, to, to take it back a little bit, um, on the BBC channel, uh, Gordon Ramsay was, was raising, I want to say pigs and, you know, he just, he got ready to slaughter the pigs to, you know, have pork for his kids. And he brought the kids out to, to slaughter it. And I thought, how amazing is that? And I can hear the outrage. I can hear the, how can you show that to a child? But that's where we're failing. You know, we're not looking at where we're getting it from, how we're taking care of it. We just want convenience. We want styrofoam plastic convenience. And that's, why we're such a fast food, you know, nation. And hopefully, you know, with, with awesome influences like yourself and others from the show, you know, that's, that, that can become a thing of the past. So no, awesome. You, you, you I, hit it right on the head so with, with that, the farm to table. Um, you know, I, I actually have participated and um, I, I was really blessed also to be a part of the Texas, beef council, like the chef's beef council. And basically there was, they've had it every year. They're, they take a group of chefs to Texas A&M. And this is like a funny story, actually. Um, I'm, I was born blonde, so I kind of have some blonde moments. And they, you know, so this is like a three-day seminar. They tell you we're going to judge on hoof, on rail. You know, we're going to taste test grass-fed beef versus corn-fed beef. And I'm just sitting here going, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, you looked at the hooves, like, I didn't know that the hoof showed you anything. And I didn't realize, duh, that means it's alive. And then when it's on the rail, it, it's dead. And so, you know, we go out there and we look at, we look at the uh, cow, the, you know, the, the, the cattle and they're showing us like, you know, muscle structure and what you'd look for on the live animal. And, you know, that's on hoof. So you would say, you know, I think this is going to, you know, grade out to a choice or select or prime. And then the next thing you know, here's this cow comes through and, you know, there's these kids, these like college kids that, you know, stun them and they cut their throat and bleed them out. And then the next thing you know, they're on rail 
and they're being cleaned down. And to see that, I thought I was gonna like not make it. And actually it was so interesting. And that's when I realized like, I don't ever wanna, you know, have a restaurant one day that just buys cases of tenderloins. You know, how messed up is that? There's only two per animal. So why, why can you buy a case of them? You know, what's, where, where's the rest of all of that going? So funny story. I realized what hoof versus rail was, but the styrofoam <laughs> trade thing is a definite issue. Yeah. Yeah, for, for, for sure. And that's, you know, sure. it, it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate that we've gone that way, but you know, I, I, the whole, you know, beef tenderloin used to be the the apex of uh, of beef because of, like you said, there's only two per animal. Of course, it's expensive. Well, now you get it on sale. Why? Well, because you can get cases of them, and it just it's it it cheapens it. It cheapens it. But you you, you first of all, great story. Um, we can talk after if you want me to edit that out. Um, <laughs> but no, no. just an awesome story Leave it in. overall. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I will. Certainly. Certainly. Cool. Um, is there anything going on in food now that's, you know, unfortunately trendy that you wish would just go away? Is there anything that just bugs the living hell out of you? Oh, I'm sure. Um, you know... I guess for me, it's hard because I used to get really worked up at a restaurant if I thought the food wasn't right. Like, what is the chef doing? What are they thinking? I was really hypercritical as a diner. And then mm -hmm. I realized, like, who cares? Like, you know, what I think and taste isn't the end all be all. And I think that our industry, that people are so hypercritical, like that needs to stop. Mm -hmm. Like, first of all, yeah, this is an art form where people yeah. are cooking what they want to do because it means something to them. And, and you don't, not everyone's supposed to get it. And, and just because you go to a restaurant and you don't get it, doesn't mean that that chef sucks or that that dish sucks, you know? that restaurant sucks. Like, that's not true. And it, granted, there's a lot of douches out there that, you know, like, ah. but at the end of the day, it's like enough ah. with the hyper, you know, it's too much. You know, it, not everyone can. That's honestly. Is a food critic. That, yeah, that's honestly the greatest answer. I don't want to disparage anybody else who's answered before. And, Chef, I, I I had my wife on, so I mean I'm I'm gonna bury her answer. That's the best answer I think I've ever gotten to that, and it's so true, it's so true. You you couldn't have nailed that anymore. At some point, but it's like enough already. Yeah. Enough. <laughs> like we can stand in an art gallery and we can look at the same painting. And we're going to see totally different things. Does that mean the painter's an asshole? Does that mean I'm an asshole? I, I, I don't think it means anybody's the asshole. No. You know, if you want to know, if you don't go out to eat, if you don't want to be surprised, like, yeah, cook at home. If you want to yeah. be in control of what it tastes like, what ingredients are in the dish, cook at home. You know, if you want a salad with just romaine lettuce, don't go out to eat that night. Like, that's not what you want. You know, it's. Oh, my. Yeah. It's, yeah. You, it, I you, don't know. I, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm not going to lie. I just, I stood up at my computer desk and started clapping. Like, like that's, that's, that's <laughs> it right there. You know, trend, trends may happen. Things may happen. But you know what? If you don't like it, move on. You know, don't, don't sit around and bitch that. Your palate is somehow more elevated than somebody else's. That's that's, God damn, you completely just I, I I have to remove that question from the interview sheet from now on. I could go a hundred episodes. That's not going to get answered more correctly than that. Wow, wow. 
Well, wow, well put. Thanks. I mean, well it's just put. true. It's brutal. It's it's. Yeah, it, it, and, and believe me, I'm sure it's true, and I'm sure people have thought it before, but leave it to Sarah Gruenberg from season nine to lay it out like you just did. That was that was freaking priceless. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to frame that moment somehow in my head. Um, so <laughs> me too. with that answer, um, let's go on to the afters. A little bit more off the cuff, out of the box, a little weird. But stick with me, I promise no one has ever been injured in the history of the podcast answering these questions, and I hope that you aren't either. Okay. Um, but if you are, I think there's a way we had you sign, so, you know, it's going to go. So I'm standing in your kitchen, okay. <laughs> professionally or at home. That's totally your decision. What music do I hear? What music do you make art to? Oh, my God. God. Well, professionally, it's like salt and pepper. There's this like station on yeah. Pandora yeah. called the Humpty Dance Channel. I love old school <laughs> hip hop. So, um, you know, there's nothing like a little, you know, salt and pepper, Snoop Dogg, you know, all that stuff that gets you going on the line. Like, there's nothing like Great, making Bolognese, getting down <laughs> to like Sir Mix a lot. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yes. You can't. I mean, you can't top that. There's, there's something to be said for, for the old school. That absolutely. Um, how is your mouth That's in the kitchen there, Chef? I'm sorry? Um, I mean, if we had to go by the movie rating system, G, PG, PG-13, straight R. Um, my kitchen? <sighs> oh, <Yeah>. goodness. <laughs> uh, I think my kitchen is a PG-13 meets R-rated. Like, R-rated in the sense of, like, maybe some really dirty jokes. Um, okay. Not so much in, like, the sing people out like you're an effing idiot, pull your head out of your ass moments. I mean, there might be a few of those, right. but not right. really too many. But I think <laughs> yeah, right I don't on. drop right the and as you, much as I used if to. If you had to name... Oh, well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear you're reformed. Um, <laughs> if, no if, if you had to name a favorite expletive you have in the kitchen, what would that be? Oh, man. I don't know. You know, I think that I have my own one, which is seriously... Like, I think when everyone knows that I say seriously, mm -hmm. it's like, what the fuck are you thinking? But I don't say that. I just say, seriously? <laughs> like, that's like the new F-bomb. Like, that's like the new, like, I like you it. are in big that's trouble. Cool. If you get the seriously, you're definitely in trouble. <laughs> nice. I like it. And and, and it's, it's societally acceptable and yet, if people work with you, they totally know what they're getting. Dude, you don't ever want to hear anyone if you're doing something and someone just walks up to you and is like, seriously? Like, that's like the worst ever. Seriously? <laughs> I'd be like, what? What I'm doing? And you're like, mm-hmm. Start over. You know better than that. And yeah, so that's, ultimately, you know, that's like that's like when I tell one of my kids. That would be more um, embarrassing. Uh, mm -hmm. it's more that's embarrassing like when I tell one of my kids, I'm not angry. Happen, I'm then just disappointed. I think oh yeah, oh the oh the guilt trip, disappointed. Mm -hmm. Oh man. But I do have to say, I'm trying to you know, save some of those harsher words for when they're really necessary. 
Because, you know, if not, then you're just the boy that cried wolf that just drops bad words all the time. And, like, no one knows when you're really serious. You know, like, when is it really serious time? And when is it just, like, any, you know? Like, there needs to be... People need to know when you're really not happy with them. I think that's when the disappointed thing comes into play. For sure. Right on. Right on. Yeah, absolutely. Boy who cried wolf. Classic, classic rationale to hold back from the from the big guns until they're needed. Um, all right, here we go. Fictitious situation. Go with me for a minute here. You're going to be stranded on a deserted island. OK, completely fictitious. Uh, unless you've been stranded on an island before. I don't know that for sure. But just in case you haven't, you're going to be stranded. Okay. You're only allowed to take three food foods or food items with you. What would they be and why? Oh my God. Like food and beverage or just food? Oh, you can totally go beverage. Well, green chartreuse will be one. So I believe that, you know, the monks, they make that and, you know, it cures all. Uh, everyone just needs a little <laughs> nip of green chartreuse in their life and you don't have the flu ever. So I'm going to go green chartreuse, one, two, oh, God. Number two, I got to go, like, my jam right now is Tootsie Roll Pops. The cherry ones. <laughs> nice. So delicious. And what could I eat every day? How about like a freezer full of home run and pizza? <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like it. I like it. Again, super, uh, that, super kind of creative cheats. answer. The third one kind of cheats, I know. But no, 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 no. And I mean, in this imaginary scenario, you, you, you have a full kitchen at your disposal. So, yeah, don't worry about it. You got a refrigerator that magically generates it. So you're in good shape. I mean, what else do you need? Like, I could be stranded for a month on pizza, chartreuse, and Tootsie Roll Pops and be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I I don't know about you. I wouldn't need another thing. So what is <laughs> if there is one a, a food or dish that still scares or intimidates you a little bit? I I know like souffle tends to be the the, the standby answer for for a couple folks. Um but I, I mean and if that's it for you, yeah, by all means, but is there anything food dish wise that's still like when you hear it, your blood runs a little cold? Oh, mm. hmm. I'm trying to think. Like, there were a few things I like practice before I went on Top Chef that I was like, oh my God, if I get asked to do this, I'm going to fail. But I guess for me, like shucking clams, like I would run like oysters or clams. Like I'm terrible at it. Terrible. So if there was ever a time where I needed to like shuck like three dozen oysters because I'm working a raw bar, I would die. Mm -hmm. Right on, right on, right on, right on. Yeah, that's that's usually the thing in the um, in the um, Mies relay that that gives people some grief if if they're not ready for it. So I can I, I can see how that oh would absolutely. It's it's definitely more of a science Dude. than you think. It's like a feel, and then like you can't overthink it because then you get all the shell in the oyster. Like, souffle is hard, right. but really, you're just whipping right. some egg whites. Making pat a shoe, I guess. Yeah. But the, the yeah. oyster, I don't know. 
Yeah, a lot more, a lot more yeah, science lot. to it. Sure. Um, no, no way. There's more science in the suplex. <laughs> Physical yeah, sure. uh, ability is what I lack in the uh, oyster department. <laughs> right on. Right on. Shifting gears a little bit, um, again, if you will, um, have you read any of Melanie Denea's books, uh, My Last Supper? I have not, but I'm familiar with the concept for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, total, total recommendation for me. There's, there's two volumes that she's done, 50 chefs each. And my wife and I, used to sit up late night and just drink wine and read these back and forth to each other. Just amazing stuff. And so I'm going to steal a little bit from Ms. Denea and ask you, Chef, what would be your ideal Last Supper? Guests, who would be there, living or deceased, uh, dishes, music, and drinks? What would it be? Oh, my goodness. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know. Like, do I do my mac and cheese and chicken fried steak? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Or do I do freaking Roman style mm-hmm. carbonara? Hmm. There's a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, and I love, right, the, I so love this question, of death. Because when 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 like chefs answer this, it's honestly like putting your feet to the flame and saying, all right, um, like like for me, for example, I have three sons. Hey, Sean, who's your favorite kid? Like, I can't answer that in good conscience. And the struggle that I hear when when people, you know, start to formulate this answer. I mean, it just shows what a reverence you have. So. All right, well, I'm definitely drinking champagne and not like cheap champagne, like small grower champagne. Lots of it, like a lot. Like there's never ending bottles. The music (laughs) has got to be Bob Marley and the Wailers and none of like the top popular 10 songs. I'm talking like the songs that not everyone listens to. Um, people, oh my God, like, do you, do I say my, my fiance? I guess I eat dinner with them all the time, or do I want to eat with someone different? Um, (laughs) no, definitely (laughs) Jane, my fiance, um, (laughs) my, uh, best friend, Rob, my mom, uh, Lady Gaga. Um, uh, I would have to go. Uh, Janis Joplin. And. We're eating steak tartare and tagliatelle with brown butter and white truffles from Alba. Jesus. Um, hopefully, uh, Sean Rossler can be added to that. That, that. that would be phenomenal. I don't ask much, but you know, you could add me to that list, right? And so, so yeah, that with that, that's that's amazing. That's 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 a dinner. I mean, it, as far as send offs go, that that I don't think that could be any more perfect. Um, amazing, amazing there. And finally, finally, chef, last question What is food to you in a single word? I'm going with the first word that came to mind. 
and I have to say beauty. Beauty. I like it. I like it. Any particular reason? Because uh, I'm weird and um, like there's something when you look at, you know, lettuce growing or you're at a market and you see these radishes, like that's beauty right there. Like wow or an oyster mm -hmm. what's not more beautiful than a raw oyster the shell you know what's inside the fact that you gotta find it you gotta like you know and then it's i mean you eat with your eyes so for me like i could look at food all day long you know it's just it's nice it it's beautiful. Yeah. And you, you, you said it and encapsulated it perfectly. You, you eat with your eyes and, you know, as, as so many times I've, I've heard either, either from the show or just, you know, in, in general, you know, that's the first thing you see, you know, you see first, you know, and it, it's, it holds so much value. And I completely agree. And Jesus, I, I appreciate the, just the, beautiful simplicity of you know the beauty of a radish the beauty of lettuce that's I think that's an awesome answer so well chef um that actually brings our time together to close episode 10 um can I help you out by plugging anything that you have coming up uh Monteverde 2015 any other details Oh man, well, more details to come for sure. We're not, you know, we're trying to keep as many things tightly lipped as possible, uh, but okay. expect some fun okay. next year for sure. Awesome, awesome. And I will certainly, certainly uh, be looking forward to it um, as I look forward to tonight. So again, I can't thank you enough um, for being part of what what I consider a pretty monumental episode number 10 so thank you so very much for being here tonight chef thank you it was like thank you for asking me because it's it's you know we, I don't think we take enough time sometimes to look back and and you know pat yourself on the back and and say wow you've really done a lot so it's been fun sharing my experience um with with everyone and thank you this was a lot of fun and now i want some champers and some white truffles <laughs> but i'm making turkey <laughs> chili tonight wow. it's just not anywhere <laughs> near truffles and champagne <laughs> i don't know though i think if it was from you i think it would be damn closer than if uh, i were to try and sling it so man again thank you so <laughs> very very much i'm so glad you had a good time and i'm so glad that you could be here to help me uh rein in episode 10 ladies and gentlemen that has been episode number 10 of the course grind podcast again my name is sean rossler host um interviewer what have you be sure to check out the course grind podcast on facebook as well as our new youtube channel and be sure to stay tuned to both sources for updates on all guests uh, current and past. My producer is Johnny Lamoria Robinson, uh, host and entrepreneur behind the Pleasure Saucer podcast. Uh, episode 11 will be coming out sooner than later, God willing. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Whoa.